Our tenth core conviction in this series this morning that we want to look at is healthy leadership. Healthy leadership. And by that, as we consider a subtitle for each one of these, uh, the one that I share with you this morning is this, under healthy leadership. We recognize that God has given to the church pastors who by their character, devotion, and humility oversee and shepherd the church, and that God has given to the church deacons who assist the pastors in ministry service. As we think about healthy leadership this morning, I want us to read our text, 1 Timothy, I said 5, but it's actually 4, excuse my mistake there, Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4, and we'll begin reading at verse number 12. Let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation, to teaching. Do not neglect the gift that you have, which was given you by prophecy when the council of elders laid their hands on you. Practice these things. Immerse yourself in them so that all may see your progress. Keep a close watch on yourself. And on the teaching, persist in this, for by so doing, you will save both yourself and your hearers. When we talk about the plan that Christ has established for the structure of his church, we we must begin by acknowledging that the church belongs to Christ. Christ. Now, I know in a very sentimental way that we often say, I love my church, or I'm thankful for my church, and and we understand what we mean by that. But ultimately, we have to constantly remind ourselves that the church belongs not to us, but to Christ. This is His church, the church that He bled and died for. He said in Matthew 16, I will Build my church. Colossians 1, he, Christ, is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning. He's the firstborn. That in everything, including the church, he might be preeminent. In a similar passage in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 23, Paul says that Christ is the head of the church Because he is the Savior of the church. In fact, in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 3, Christ is called the chief shepherd. The chief shepherd of the church. So we must begin by understanding that the church belongs to Christ. He is the head. He is the one with ultimate authority. It is from Christ's position of ultimate authority and headship that the Bible goes on to teach us that he has established pastors to lead and oversee his church as under-shepherds of the chief shepherd. So, So the chief shepherd is not me. The chief shepherd is Jesus. And underneath the chief shepherd... Christ has established under shepherds, pastors to lead and oversee his congregations. You know, there are a few interchangeable New Testament words that refer to the different functions of the office of pastor. We see in the New Testament the word overseer or bishop. It speaks of the function that pastors have in giving oversight to the church. That is, they're in charge of the church. They are stewards of Christ's church. Christ is the owner. Pastors are the overseers. Pastors are the the stewards. They've given charge over the direction, the doctrine, and the mission of the church. Uh, We also see words like pastor and shepherd. So we see words like overseer and bishop, and we see words like pastor or shepherd, which simply implies the function of 
uh, leading the church and teaching the church and caring for the church as a shepherd cares for sheep, protecting the church as a shepherd protects uh, the sheep. And so, so the pastor, he, he's an overseer, uh, he, he, he's a shepherd, but there's another word, it's the word elder. Elder is very similar to overseer. Again, it means to, to lead the church or preside over the church. Now, now each of these terms, they, they all refer to the same office that we call pastor, but each highlighting different functions. So, so biblically speaking, when we come across these terms, here's what we need to understand. Pastors, biblically speaking, pastors are elders who shepherd and oversee the church. That's what pastors are. They are elders who shepherd and oversee the church. Now, I I personally do believe that Scripture shows a pattern of lay elders. What do we mean by lay elders in our culture and understanding of the Scripture? We mean that there are gifted and qualified men to serve pastorally in a congregation but may not do so vocationally, vocationally. They're non-vocational, but yet gifted and qualified with with the same characteristics and callings that God puts on full-time vocational pastors. And and these these elders, lay elders, however you want to refer to them, they, they come alongside of the vocational pastors and sharing some of the responsibilities of shepherding. Although here at Laurel we have three vocational pastors, elders, it would be wise for us to consider for the future of our ministry this pattern of developing lay elders in our church, of course, as God leads us to do so. But how does that work with the office of deacon? That's the second office that we see. The first office that Christ established is the office of pastor. And then we see the pastors in the book of Acts establishing the office of of deacon. Well, deacons are not overseers. That's the major difference. Pastors, elders are overseers. Uh, Deacons are not overseers. The word word deacon means servant. A deacon is is a church member who meets certain character requirements and is designated by the pastors and elders to assist in specific ministry assignments. Now, the reason for understanding these functions of church leadership in pastors and deacons is clearly due to the danger of subtly allowing a secular political view of governance to slip into the church and replace God's ordained function for church leadership. In other words, the church is not a pure democracy. But too many churches today have adopted the democratic views of secular governance and brought them into the church, thereby usurping God's ordained function for pastoral headship and deacon ministry. In other words, the church is not designed to be ran like a political party or a social club where the majority vote sets the direction. That's why we don't vote on things around here. If we have a vote in our church, it means you're getting a new pastor, which means I'm in trouble. (laughs) The church was never designed to function that way. The spiritual and directional oversight, decision-making, has been given to specific Leaders, And that is how God dealt with the nation of Israel. And under the new covenant, it is how he dealt with the church. And it's how we are to pattern ourselves today. So it's important. It's important that in light of this, listen very carefully, that the leadership be right. That the leadership be right. And that those church leaders are healthy leaders. The Bible's clear that when the New Testament churches were filled with healthy leaders, pastors, elders, and deacons who carried out their responsibilities well, the New Testament tells us that 
the knowledge of God's word grew in the heart of the people. The gospel went forth in fruitfulness unhindered. And God was chiefly glorified. And that's the focus today in this final core conviction. Something that has been very important to us since the day we relaunched as a church in 2008. In fact, it was embedded in our conversations. As I met with that original group of 30 people coming in as a new pastor, we had to make it clear that leadership in this church would not be based upon political rallies and popularity votes. That we had to do this thing biblically. We had to guard the leadership. We had to protect the heart of it and make sure that the right people are serving in the right places. If not, there's danger ahead for the church. Healthy leadership. I want us to briefly look at 1 Timothy chapter 4 as Paul reminds us about the necessity of healthy church leaders and what that looks like. In fact, we could call it three marks of healthy church leadership. Three marks of healthy church leadership. Here's, here's the first one. It's the mark of godly character. Godly character. Look at what Paul told Timothy in verse 12. Timothy, who is assuming the role of elder here in the church of Ephesus, lead pastor, if you will. And he says to him in verse 12, set the believers an example. Set the believers an example. That is, first and foremost, church leaders are to be people who set an example of what godly character looks like. This is why God has given to us qualifications for church leaders. To ensure that they are always striving to set an example for other believers to follow. And I emphasize that phrase, other believers to follow. Because this character of godliness is not exclusively for church leaders. It's very easy to open up the passages like 1 Timothy chapter 3 and say, all right, this is what God expects out of pastors, elders. This is what God expects out of deacons. Well, man, I'm glad I'm not one of those. Oh, look, if you're viewing these godly characteristics as something that you get out of because you don't fulfill that office, you are misunderstanding the Scriptures. Because the purpose of the qualifications is so that the leaders of the church would live in such a way that the people of the church would have a living example in front of them on how they ought to conduct their Christian life. All Christians are led to godliness by the Word of God and the Spirit of God. But let me say that it is clear through the New Testament epistles, and especially here in the book of 1 Timothy, that the leaders of the church are to be the examples that we can point to and say, do what they do. Now think about that for a moment. The leaders are to conduct themselves in such godliness that we can go to any member of the church and point to that leader and say, do what they do. Do what they do. I know that's not only a convicting thought for myself as the lead pastor of this congregation and Austin and RJ and other pastors, but I think about our deacons as well. Those who serve in that leadership team, Simon and, and Steve and Charwin and, and those who have, those who are, Brian, others. That this, this all applies to them. That we are to conduct ourselves in such a godly manner that we can look and say, hey, look at Brian. Do what Brian does. Look at Simon. Do what Simon does. Look at Steve, Charwin. Do what they do. Look at Austin, RJ, uh, Pastor Jonathan. Do what they do. That's the purpose of the, of the leaders of the church living in such godly character because we have to set the pace for godliness. The writer of Hebrews says it like this in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 7. Remember your leaders, especially those who speak to you the word of God, and imitate their faith. Imitate their faith. Now let me say here, this is not a call to perfection. There's no need for the gospel if it was possible for us to perfectly meet God's standards of godliness and holiness. And if this was a call to perfection, then God would have no one to call, frankly. Because none of the leaders of this church are perfect 
in any stretch of the imagination. The purpose here of him laying this out is so that the hearts of the leaders will be fixed not on themselves, not on the world, but on Jesus. And when the leaders fall short of that goal, healthy leaders continue to set an example of godly character by humbly repenting of their sin. And perhaps maybe that is the major distinction between healthy and unhealthy leaders because all leaders fall short of the qualifications. All leaders fall short of the character requirements. I don't always love the way that I need to love. My faith is not always where it needs to be and so on and so forth as we will look here. But the distinguishing difference is whether or not those leaders are so in tune with Jesus that when they recognize their failings and their shortcomings, do they repent of their sin and move into purity or do they continue in the hardness of their heart? Well, Paul gives a summary in verse 12 of what kind of example healthy church will set, healthy church leaders will set. Let me just mention them to you. There are five here. He says, first, you'll, you'll set an example of speech, of speech, church leaders, those, those who fill these roles. What, what are we looking for as a leadership team when we go and we select the next deacon who will come in and serve the next term? But we're looking for men who set an example in their tongues in their speech. That is what we say and how we say it. Are we known for building people up or tearing them down? Are the leaders honest or manipulative and misleading? Are we hot-headed and quick-tempered or are we slow to speak, giving the benefit of the doubt? Do we gossip or are we self-controlled? There's so many things that are implied here, but he said, healthy church leaders, Timothy, set an example by the things that you say, and we can also imply here, set an example by not always having to say anything, which is oftentimes the hardest thing to do. In fact, I know it is for me. One of my biggest struggles is learning how to stay quiet. Speech. He says, I want you to also set an example in conduct. Healthy church leaders set an example of godliness in their conduct. That's our manner of life, our manner of life, how we live, how we interact with others, how we carry ourselves, how we love our spouse, how we provide for our family, how we guard our hearts from sin. Conduct. And then he mentions love. Set an example in love. Church leaders have to be known for their peacemaking, their, their, their unity because of their love for God and the people of God. Troublemakers are not fit for church leadership. This is to be a love that is without discrimination, a love that sacrifices, a love that serves a love that is quick to forgive. A love that is kind to everyone. You know, kindness, I believe, is losing its, its luster in our culture. I am blown away by some Christian people that I can pass in a hallway, look in their eye, and say good morning, and then I get mumbled at. Have we lost our sense of kindness? Unkind people are not fit to be the examples that church leadership requires. Love, love that forgives, love that is kind, love that is patient, love that is compassionate, love that is humble, love that is steadfast, and evident love for God. An evident love for God's people. And then he says, I want you, Timothy, number four, to set an example in faith. In faith. It speaks of the different dynamics of faith, such as the knowledge of the faith. Godly leaders, healthy leaders need to be people who have good knowledge of the faith. That's why he says these, these, these men, they, they don't need to be novices. 
They need to have good knowledge of the faith. They need to be committed to the disciplines of the faith. They are people of prayer. They are people of the word. They, they are people of the gospel. That is, they, they evangelize regularly. You, you don't have to wonder where they're at on Sunday and Wednesday. You know because they're there. The disciplines of the faith are a priority in their life. And then we see an overall just commitment to the faith. Paul is saying, Timothy, if you are going to serve in this capacity, you need to set an example. Lead the way in your faith. Lead the way in your love, your conduct, your speech. And then finally, he says, set an example in purity. Purity of mind. Purity of heart. Purity of body. This is the idea of living by the guardrails that protect us. That protect our minds, that protect our hearts, that protect our Bodies. The point that we're trying to make here from this passage, and listen very carefully, when it comes to church leadership, it is not brilliance, it is not charm, and it is not popularity that God requires. It is first and foremost godly character. Godly character. Secondly, he says that healthy church leaders are not only people of godly character, but they are people who are fully devoted. Or I wrote here in my notes, full devotion, full devotion. Now, in Paul's second letter to Timothy, and we're going to come back to the text here in just a moment, but in Paul's second letter to Timothy, chapter 4 and verse 5, he makes four rapid-fire statements about pastoral ministry in particular. He tells the pastors to, first of all, be sober-minded. He tells them, secondly, to endure suffering. He tells them, thirdly, to do the work of an evangelist. And then he tells them, fourthly, to fulfill their ministry. Fulfill their ministry. Be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, and fulfill your ministry. In other words, be fully devoted to fulfilling your ministry. Your ministry. And that thought is sprinkled throughout the New Testament passages on church leadership, whether it's to the pastor, elder, or the deacon. What he's saying is is that church leadership shouldn't be entered into casually. It should not be entered into without proper calling. In order... For a church to have healthy leadership, it must have leaders who are passionately and fully devoted to the task, to the task, which in part works together with our first point. Because think about this. Churches can have leaders who have godly character in their example, okay, but if they're not dependable, if they're not reliable, If they don't ever respond to your messages, if they don't show up on time, if they can't care for the people the way they ought to, listen, if they're not dependable, reliable, and devoted to the task, then they're not fit for church leadership, no matter how good their character may appear. These things work together. Paul, back in 1 Timothy chapter 4, he calls our attention to two specific areas that healthy leaders are to be fully devoted to. And he says, first of all, in verse 13, They're to be fully devoted to the Scriptures. Fully devoted to the Scriptures. Verse 13, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation, to teaching. And then he says in verse 15, immerse yourself in this. Immerse yourself in the public reading, the teaching, the the exhortation of the Scriptures. I think that is both in personal study and walk with Christ as well as the public ministry of reading, teaching, and applying the Scriptures, whether that be in the form of pulpit ministry as I am doing this morning or in the form of private Scripture ministry, discipling others, counseling them. They are so devoted to the Scriptures. They are so devoted to the Scriptures. They understand that this is my responsibility. My responsibility is first and foremost to the Scriptures. Of course, This is the supreme work of pastors, isn't it? The pastors in Acts chapter 6, 
said we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. We will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And sometimes we often think that that's, you know, what, what, what big of a responsibility is that? I'm sure, Pastor, on Saturday night you open your Bible, look at the next text, shot down a few notes, and then come up here and holler at us. I wish, honestly, it was that easy. I wish it was that easy. It's not. It's draining. It's pressure. There's sometimes I go home sick. Sick. Because I'm so fixed on having the mind of Christ through his word. I'm not sure that I have it sometimes. I need to know what he says, not what I think about it. I need to know what he wants us to understand, what he meant when he said that. It takes a lot of digging, a lot of praying, a lot of searching, a lot of studying, a lot of phone calls to Austin, a lot of phone calls to my dad. Hey, help, I need help. But it's full devotion. Paul told Timothy, above all things, Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 4, preach the word. Preach the word. Of course, our text gives us further guidance to make sure church leaders are devoted to the scriptures and not their traditions and not their silly debates. But verse, verse 6 of this chapter, look at it, verse 6, 1 Timothy 4, be trained in the words of the faith. Be trained in them. Be trained in the words. Be trained in good doctrine, verse 7. Have nothing to do with irreverent or silly myths. Church leader, no, we, we don't give ourselves over to silly debates, traditions, preferences, bringing our desires to the surface, trying to get people to look like us and think like us and talk like us. No, no, no. It's about the pure word of God. In another letter to Titus, Titus chapter 3 and verse 9, it's actually a very strong warning. Paul says, to the church leaders there, avoid, avoid foolish controversies. Are you a controversial person? I mean, do you, do you thrive on it? Do you thrive on it? He says, avoid foolish controversies, genealogies, dissensions, quarrels about the law. Should we eat this? Should we eat that? Should we drink that? Should we drink this? Can we go here? Can we go now? Well, I have opinion. He has opinion. She has an opinion. Paul says, stop that. Stop it. These things are unprofitable and worthless, he says. In fact, he goes on to say in verse 10, as far as a person who stirs up division... After warning that person once and twice, the implication is that they keep on stirring up division after that, then have nothing more to do with them, knowing that such a person is warped, they're sinful, and they're self-condemned. Boy, that's strong language, isn't it? Whether it's the church leadership or the church laity, whatever it involves, those who give themselves over to division and friction and strife and arguments and decision, dissension and controversies, the Bible says that is a warped and sinful person and don't have anything to do with them. Especially don't put them in church leadership. That's why we don't vote on leaders. Because there's sometimes people that the leaders of the church who work with understand there's a lot more going on behind the door of their life than you may appear. And it's the responsibility of the leaders to safeguard the overall health of the church. And when we start bringing in political campaigns in order to promote the person that we want in the office that we desire, then that's when the health goes downhill. It's up to the leaders of the church to make sure that we're not having anything to do with people who are divisive. They're to be avoided altogether. Fully devoted to the scripture. Secondly, he says, fully devoted to their responsibilities. 
fully devoted to their responsibilities. Go, go back to 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 14. Do not neglect the gift that you have. The gift is a reference to the responsibilities that Timothy has been given on account of his calling. Do not neglect these gifts which was given you by prophecy when the council of elders laid their hands on you. Practice these things. Immerse yourself in them. Here's, here's the key to me. Look at this next phrase. That all may see your progress. So he says here, leadership is both a gift and a calling. It's to be approved on by the other leaders of the church. And it comes with a tremendous amount of responsibility where full devotion is required. Don't neglect it. Don't neglect it. Don't be lazy about it. Don't be unreliable. Don't be incompetent. Take your responsibility seriously. In fact, and he says it clearly, church leaders are to be so immersed in their responsibilities that others are able to see did you see that? See. That all may see. See what? See their faithfulness as well as their personal spiritual growth. They ought to be able to see that. Not assume it. They ought to be able to see it. They ought to look at the leaders of the church and see them being faithful. See them Growing spiritually. I was just a kid when I started pastoring these 30 people in 2008. People would walk in the door, come to me and ask for the pastor. I'm the, I'm the pastor. And then I'd get the look, you know. You know what would come next? Well, what kind of church is this? <laughs> All the kids are in charge. I, I look back on some of the papers I wrote in college, and I have burned them. I took down a blog that I started when I started pastoring. I don't want anybody to read that junk. There are sermon archives that you'll never be able to find <laughs> that I've said in this building that I am amazed that God still lets me continue to be the pastor here. It's amazing to me how impatient sometimes churches, and I'm not talking about this one. No pastor stays here 15 years, any place, without patient people. Okay? I'm just talking about other places. How impatient churches get with a pastor when God begins to sanctify him. It is very unfair to treat any pastor fresh out of college as if he ought to be the same guy when he resigns from ministry at the age of 65. He better not be the same guy. He better not preach the same way in his 40s as he did in his 30s. He better preach differently. He better serve differently. He better think differently. His doctrine may adjust. His preferences ought to change. Why is it that we say amen to the Holy Spirit's work of sanctification in everybody else's life except the pastor's? We don't want him to change. No. When we brought you here, we expect you to do this. And now you're changing this. And you're changing that. We don't even know what we're doing anymore. Well, when did we stop thinking that God sanctifies my heart as well? I'm not the same guy that those 30 people took a chance on 15 years ago. Amen, Betty? <laughs> and I guarantee you, the eight remaining are saying, and thank God he's not. Now, we don't want in sad terms to go backwards. We don't want to have people serving on leadership teams and deacons and children's ministries and things like that who were once the godly character and commitment, and now we look and we're like, what happened? And we don't want that, but we do want progress. We want progress. Somebody said to me recently, they said, Pastor, our church services 
have never been more reverential than they are right now. That's because God changed me about some things. I'm not up here like I was in my 20s as an MC in a group of people. I'm up here as a shepherd whose one goal is to get you to see Jesus with the little bit of time that we have. Listen, I could talk about this all morning. The point is, the point is, we ought to see personal, spiritual growth in our leaders. I think one of the saddest testaments we could ever say about a church leader, say, he's been the same old guy for X amount of years. That's a bad testimony. I hope my wife can look at me after almost 20 years of marriage and say, you know what? He loves me better than he did when we first got married. Now, I don't know if she'd say that or not. You're going to have to ask her. (laughs) I hope she can say that he helps me around the house more than he did when we first got married. Look, I was a jerk when we first got married. I saw my view in the recliner. That was my role, to recline. (laughs) My role was to recline and watch TV, and her role was to fix me sweet tea (laughs) and bring it to me when I needed it. I was a jerk. I was a jerk. God had to grow me. And it's amazing how the Lord does that. Sometimes he sends Nathans. Sometimes he sends your wife to say, if you don't grow up, we're going to have some bad problems around here. I hope my wife can say that I've changed. I hope my children can say that I've changed. I've become a better daddy. I hope my church can say that he's become a better pastor, that he's grown, and I can see his growth. I can see his growth. And some people don't like the growth that they see in someone's heart, and that's fine, and that's fine. But I know what God's doing in here, and I know what God's doing in the hearts of Simon. And Steve and Charwin and the others, Austin, who come together and help us lead the church. We ought to be able to see the faithfulness of our leaders. If you can't see your leaders being faithful, then they're not healthy leaders and they need to abandon the the position. And if you can't see your leaders personally and spiritually growing, then they need to abandon the position. All right. So Phil... In full devotion, your responsibilities. Do all that the ministry requires you to do. And that ties into our final mark of healthy leadership. Godly character, full devotion. Number three, gospel humility. Gospel humility. Now again, we're going to come back to 1 Timothy chapter 4 in a minute. But let me just, let's just parallel this for a second. Because in Peter's letter, 1 Peter chapter 5, he, he begins that chapter, that paragraph, by addressing the roles and responsibilities of pastors. And then he turns to the church members in that same chapter and speaks to them about the importance of humility in their relationship. That the church members need to be humble, the pastors, the leaders need to be humble. And and he goes on to say that if the church leaders and the church members are not humble in their relationship with each other, they'll not experience the joy and blessing and peace that this relationship is intended to bring. In 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 5, he says, clothe yourselves, all of you, all of you. Now, if we stop right there without reading the rest of the verse, that's probably a good thing to do, all right? Every day, put some clothes on. Put some clothes on. Clothe yourselves, all of you. But here's what he wants us to specifically clothe ourselves with. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Why do churches shut down? Because they violated 1 Peter 5.5. 5. Somewhere down along the way, the pastors, the leaders, and the people stopped acting in humility toward one another. And God turned his back on it. It is to the humble that God gives grace. It's to be the clothing that every believer, all of us, dress ourselves in every day. But especially, church family, especially those who lead the church. Humble people. Where does this humility come from? 
Well, it comes from a proper view of ourselves in light of the gospel. That brings me back to the final verse in 1 Timothy chapter 4. He says, keep a close watch on yourself. Speaking to the church leaders. Keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching and persist in this. Persist in this for by so doing, you will save both yourself and your hearers. So there's a gospel humility here that guards our hearts. That guards our hearts. That is, church leaders are to keep a close watch on themselves. They are to persist in guarding their hearts because in doing so, they will save themselves. What does that look like? That means we ought to preach the gospel to ourselves every day. Church leaders are to live their lives from the gospel. Not from rules, not from the law, not from popularity contests. No, we live our lives from the gospel. We live our lives in the gospel. We saturate our hearts with gospel truth. And when our hearts are saturated with the gospel, it will keep us from being prideful leaders. It will keep us from being judgmental leaders. It will keep us from being hypocritical leaders. We must keep a close watch on ourselves. That is guarding our hearts in humility with the gospel. And then he says secondly here, a gospel humility that not only guards our hearts, but guards our people. Guards our people. So he says keep a close watch not only on yourselves, but on the teaching. Teaching again, persist in this because in doing so you'll save your hearers. So when you keep when you keep a guard on your heart and persist in that, that means every day I'm protecting my heart. Every day I'm guarding my heart. Every day I'm saturating my heart with the gospel. Then I'm going to save myself. I'm going to protect myself. But then he says, I want you to take that same persistence and keep a close watch on your people, especially, especially what you teach, and especially. The teaching that happens throughout the church. Throughout the church. Because when you persist in this, you will save, protect the hearers. This is why we care very seriously about the manner in which we teach and preach the Bible. And I get it. I've I've had some friends come a few times, not many times, and whether I'm sitting there or there, I'm just thinking to myself, oh, man, I messed up. The message was nothing to do with the Bible, or maybe they taught something in a way that is unbiblical, or I ask God to repent, and then I rip up the phone number and never invite them again. It's also why I take very seriously my time in the study. I'm God's representative to you. It's why I take very seriously the men in our church who provide the teaching. Because it's my job in gospel humility to protect our people by making sure that those who teach and preach the scriptures keep the gospel central among many other things. This is what Paul told a group of leaders in Acts chapter 20 and verse 28. He said, pay careful attention to yourself, okay, and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained by his own blood, For I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in. All right, so we have a warning here. Guard your heart. Guard the teeth. Don't let just anybody teach. Keep a close watch on those who come in because I'm telling you, wolves are going to come in. Wolves are going to come in. And what are they going to do? They're going to tear the flock apart. He says, not only are wolves going to come in from the outside, he says in Acts 20, 30, they're also from your own selves. That means on the inside are going to arise men speaking twisted things. They're not going to be faithful to the scriptures. 
In fact, the whole purpose of what they're doing, the very next phrase, is to draw away disciples after them. They're not teaching for the glory of God. They desire a following for themselves. They're trying to build their own little church by having their own little Bible study outside of the church Bible studies. Because they want to build their own following. They want people to attach themselves to who they are and what they want to do. Which is why in 1 Timothy 5.22, Paul says, don't be hasty in laying your hands on people. Now, let's, let's, let's clarify that. Because there's some people that you work with that you're like, Okay, that has some merit. Don't be hasty in wringing anybody's neck, all right? But the spiritual implication of this, the idea of laying on hands is ordaining someone to gospel ministry, ordaining them with the ability to, to teach, to stand here and teach. And Paul tells Timothy, listen, there are some people who say the right things, they look the right part, and they're just trying to win you over long enough for them to get a pulpit or a podium somewhere. And when they do, they're going to tear the church apart because it's all about them and it's not about the gospel. He says, so don't be rushed at getting people to teach and preach in the congregation lest they destroy your church. Now, I'll leave that there for us just to ponder on. But the point is, the point is that the leaders of the church are to view themselves and the people with gospel humility. A humility that doesn't put ourselves in the front, but puts the Lord Jesus in the front. I want to close with Hebrews 13 in an important verse within the context of church health and leadership. The writer tells us as a church that we're to do three things for pastors and elders. That is the relationship between a church family and its leaders. We are to follow them in verse 7. I'm not going to read the scriptures, but they're there. Hebrews 13, 7. He says, I want you to follow your leaders, your pastors. I want you to submit to them. That's the second thing he tells them in verse 17 to do. So follow them. Submit to them. And then number 3 in verse 19 of Hebrews 13, he says, pray for them. Pray for them. So follow them. Submit to them. Pray for them. Now, there are other places in scripture that instruct us in additional aspects of this relationship, all right? There are, there are other things we could comment on here. But, but, but this is a good summary, okay? Follow, submit, pray for. It's important because in Hebrews chapter 13, what we learn is that just as pastors will give an account for God for how they lead the church, Hebrews 13 also tells us that the church will give an account to God for how they treat their pastors. Now that, stuff like this is hard for me to preach because I know it may seem self-serving. But scripture is scripture. And for us to stand before God with a clear conscience, we need to make sure that we understand the dynamics of this relationship well. Churches will give an account for how they treat their pastors and elders. And pastors and elders will give an account for how they led their churches. Simple as that. So he says, follow them, submit to them, pray for them. And then, then, then here's, the, here's the, the emphasis, all right? Because right in the middle of all of that, this chapter, Hebrews 13, immediately following verse 7, after he says, obey your pastors, follow them, submit to them, we see verse 8. And on the surface, it seems like, well, what does that have to do with anything. Well, it has everything to do with it. Because look at it. In verse 7, follow your pastors, submit to them, obey them. But in verse 8, but understand that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So, so here's the message of the writer of Hebrews. Follow and submit to your pastors, but you better keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. Follow your pastors, fix your eyes on Jesus. Pray for your pastors, keep your eyes on Jesus. Submit to your pastors, keep your eyes on Jesus. Why? Because your pastors, your deacons, your leaders, they're not perfect, but Jesus is perfect. 
Your pastors, your leaders, they're going to fail you, but Jesus will never fail you. Your pastors and leaders can't always be there for you, but Jesus will always be there for you. Keep your eyes on Jesus. And we don't ever want to get that out of balance. Give honor to whom honor is due. Yes, especially those who labor in the word. But don't let the leaders of the church take the place of Jesus. You see, it is ultimately the task of leadership to see those whom we lead attached not to ourselves, but to the Lord Jesus Christ. It is the ultimate task of leadership to see those whom we lead not so much attached to our goals, but attached to the glory and gospel of Jesus Christ. So we must keep it in proper balance. For both have an important role of health to maintain the purity of the church life. So what do we do with this? Well, we simply ask God to pour his grace out on us and help us to always strive for healthy leadership. Something we take extremely seriously. That those who lead us will be leaders of godly character. Full devotion to the task. And of course, gospel humility. And may the church in return follow them, submit to them in prayer. Let's bow our heads together for prayer.